Hello, uh, my name is Stanislav Omichev. Uh, I'm part of the Linux kernel networking team at Google. I work on the BPF subsystem of the kernel. Um, at Google, I mostly write, debug, and deploy BPF programs and support our kernel. Today, I'm going to talk about how and why we've removed the HTTP queuing discipline and replaced it with a solution based on BPF and ETT. Uh, one important note I want to mention is that we didn't really set a goal to fully reproduce all HTTP features. Even though it's probably possible, we didn't do it because we didn't use all the features internally. Uh, so we focused only on rate limiting, uh, the only feature from the HTTP that we were using. Another note is that it's a joint work that involved multiple people and teams, uh, and I will list them all at the end of the talk. Let's start with uh, some context because we've previously shared some parts of this work at Linux Plumbers Conference. Um, our service classify, measure, rate limit, and we mark outgoing packets, meaning for every outgoing packet, we do the following steps. Uh, first one is classification. We find out which container this packet belongs to. I'll call this container an aggregate. Many TCP flows can belong to the same aggregate. Uh, next one is measurement. We count uh, the packet and byte rate for each aggregate. Another one is rate limiting. If the aggregate rate limit is uh, higher than some pre-configured number, we throttle the packets. And lastly, sometimes we also rewrite some parts of the packet to change the quality of service. About two years ago at Linux Plumbers Conference, we've shared how we moved classification measurement and remarking from HTB to BPF. Uh, so this talk is a follow-up presentation on how we've moved that last bit rate limiting into BPF. Um, all right, let's define some terms that are essential. The first one is EDT for earliest departure time. This is the idea proposed by Ivan Jacobson at NetDev about eight years ago. And the gist of it goes like this. Let's replace all the internal networking queues with a timing wheel scheduler. Every packet is amended with a earliest departure time and the system will not send it out until the departure time is met. Uh, this departure time can be adjusted at various places in the kernel. Next one is FQ for fair queue. It's a queuing discipline that was added to the Linux kernel by, by Eric de Maze. Independent FQ instance is usually created for each hardware NIC queue, and FQ tries to fairly distribute the available networking bandwidth between multiple TCP flows. Uh, important note here is that compared to global HDB, there is no global FQ and hence no global queue disk log. For our purposes, FQ behaves like a timing wheel scheduler. It doesn't send out the packet until their earliest departure time is met. Uh, and uh, Linux kernel has been converted to the EDT model around 2018. Moving on, here is uh, more details about how our on-host pre-EDT architecture looked like. We have an external system called BWE, short for Bandwidth Enforcer, that dynamically pushes aggregate limits to the hosts. This means that most traffic is actually not limited. If you want to know more about BWE, there is an open paper. I've added the link to the slides. Then on every machine, there is a daemon that creates flat HTTP hierarchy based on those BWE rules. For every aggregate, that's rate limited, we essentially create a HTB leaf with appropriate limit. Next, at TC egress hook, the BPF program runs. It classifies the packet into appropriate aggregate by setting its TC class ID member. If there is an HTB leaf for that class ID, this traffic can be potentially rate limited, and we rely on HTB talking bucket mechanism to enforce this limit. And the problem with that scheme was that when many aggregates needed to be rate limited on the host, we were getting contention in the HTB. 
to understand why it happens, let's look at the HTTP architecture. Modern NICs have multiple hardware queues to support high transmission rates. Linux can put the packets on each uh, separate queue without any need of global synchronization. Unfortunately, with HTTP, each hardware queue still shares the same underlying HTTP instance acting like a global log. Here is a small uh, code snippet on how it works. Um, we first call uh, netdef core pictx function, which should pick a per nic queue queue disk based on the flow hash or XPS. Then we call def xmit skb. This function locks queue disk and queues the packet and unlocks it. Um, no matter how many hardware queues we have, each time we send the packet, we grab the same global log. I've tried to summarize what's happening in that picture on the right. So we have two new queues, but they share the same underlying HTTP. So how can we fix the situation? Um, we've decided to completely drop HTTP We've had some attempts at sharding HTTP internally with various successes, but ultimately with the EDT model decided that we don't really need to use it anymore. Instead, we've switched to the MQ, short for multi-queue, which is a lockless queue disk that creates a sub-queue disk for each NIC queue. As a sub-queue disk, we've picked FQ because it enforces the EDT model and acts like a timing wheel. On top of that, we've implemented a small rate limiter in BPF uh, that adjusts the departure timestamp. Uh, and again, I tried to summarize what's happening with the picture on the right. Uh, so BPF program just adjusts the departure time. Then netdef core peak TX picks independent per QFQ instance without grabbing any global log. And then we rely on FQ to enforce the departure timestamp. Um, and here is the simplified BPF program that we run for each packet. As you can see, it's significantly smaller than the 1500 lines of HTTP. Uh, but to be fair, we still rely on FQ for the EDT enforcement. So it's not really apples to apples comparison. The real BPF program that we run is pretty short as well. It's less than 100 lines. So the steps that we do are relatively simple. We first classify the packet into an aggregate. Then we calculate possible delay, which depends on the programmed rate limit and the length of the packet. And then we expect the next timestamp value of the aggregate to see if we are allowed to send the packet right now or we should delay it. Um, if next timestamp is less than the current time, we update, update the aggregate value and exit, no rate limiting happens. If the packet is delayed by more than drop horizon, we drop it. In this example, the drop horizon is two seconds. Uh, otherwise, if the packet is delayed, but not too much, we update SKB timestamp and atomically increase the aggregate uh, next timestamp. Uh, that weird sync and fetch at the end is an atomic increment in BPF. Note that when the aggregate is not rate limited, uh, we update next timestamp value in a racing manner right here. Uh, but we haven't found any problems with that approach. The reason is we can't really do better because there is no yet uh, compare and exchange operation on BPF. Also note that most of the traffic exits way early because there is no rate limit for the aggregate. Um, so I, I haven't shown that part in this example. As you can see, it's not really a HDB re-implementation of BPF. As I mentioned earlier, we haven't really had that goal in mind. We mostly care about performance and having no global egress lock and the combination of BPF and FQ lets us achieve that. Uh, we also don't need any fancy HTTP features like token borrowing or any form of hierarchical limits. Um, the natural question usually at this point goes like this, can those features be implemented with BPF? 
And the answer is probably yes. PPF right now has very limited support for atomic operation. I know that community is working on it, on it right now. Uh, so we would have to use something like PPF spin locks to keep this global shared state. And this can, in theory, negatively impact the performance. So any feature creep can imp impact the performance. So for us, it is important to keep that part small and simple. Uh, and here are some performance numbers. Uh, Y-axis is latency. It's normalized to the range from zero to 800 and X exits is time. Um, I hope here you can spot the time when we switched to the PPF rate limiter. Um, the red line is 99th percentile, the blue line is 95th percentile, and the green line is 50th percentile. There is about 20x improvement in latency for 99th percentile and 10x improvement for 99th. Uh, 50th percentile also improved about 2x, but it's it's really hard to see on that graph. Uh, if you're interested in building something like this, uh, here's a bunch of pointers from the kernel sources. The first one is a self-test that we've added to show uh, how you can build a small EDT-based rate limiter. It's very simple and it rate limits just a single flow. It's uh, a nice working example if you want to start building something like that from scratch. The second one is more involved and was contributed by Facebook. If you need to have something that's workable and feature reach out of the box, you might take a look at that. Um, it has multiple modes for rate limiting and EDT mode is, is one of them. And before we finish, I'd like to also say a couple of words. So why we choose to do this work in BPF instead of writing native code. Uh, the biggest reason is all the parts were already there. So the FQ has been around for a while and we were using BPF TC hook for classification management and remarking already. I think the only extension to the kernel that we did was to expose SKP departure timestamp to the PPF and that's it. Um, another big reason that is release velocity. We were able to prototype, uh, implement and test everything with an easy rollback sequence. Fixing the bugs was as easy as reinstalling the BPF program without any um, any reboot of the hosts. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, various parts of this work were done by many people. I've listed them here in no particular order. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. So again, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, thus far, there's one. Uh, so I was wondering, I, I believe in the BPF code, there was a call to classify. I was wondering how that works. Yeah, for the uh, classification, uh, you can think of it like a, uh, there is a helper in BPF. It's called BPF SKB C group ID, get something like that which basically looks up a socket associated with the SKB and then looks up a C group ID associated with this SKB. Uh, because for us, it's uh, what we care about is like container or aggregate. So we basically uh, look up associated C group ID. It's, it's more complicated in, in Google's case because there's some also custom logic, but in general, it's, it's basically C group ID. Okay. Uh, next question: The setting of the EDT timestamp can uh, can that possibly be in the C group SKB egress hook? Yeah, I think it it can be. It's it's mostly historical. Um, we run it at TC egress, but I think it's it's definitely possible to do the same at C group egress. Next question: This is only for flows originating on the host, right? Or is it also used in packet forwarding? Uh, yeah, it's mostly about uh, on the host flows. Okay. So uh, let's see, I don't see any more questions and I don't see any hands raised. So thank you. Uh, 